I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Jessie Heineken was born in 1799 and lived with her family in Deneville Place, Swansea, becoming a member of Swansea's Anti-Slavery Society, which was the largest and most committed anti-slavery society in Wales. In her 20s, Jessie opened and taught at her own school in Wine Street for the education of young ladies and gentlemen. When Jessie was 34, she and the Anti-Slavery Society helped a young slave runaway called Willis to become a free man in Swansea. Willis, aged 20, had stowed away on board a copper ore carrier in New Orleans and had arrived at the Landor Copper Works dockside in February 1833. Swansea's Port Reeve, the mayor, Mr. T. Edward Thomas, was sent for and declared Willis a free man on the dockside. In 1840, when Jessie was 41, she married her cousin, Francis Donaldson, who had come over from Cincinnati and they set up home in Grove Place. The Cincinnati Donaldsons were running two safe houses, Frandon and Penmine, for runaway slaves on the banks of the Ohio River, across from the slaveholding state of Kentucky. Jesse worked for the anti-slavery campaign throughout the American Civil War. We don't know how many runaway slaves she sheltered in that time. Jessie eventually returned home to Swansea in 1866. In 1874, the Fisk Jubilee Singers freed slaves from Fisk University, Tennessee on a fundraising tour for their campus buildings performed at Crathall Street Music Hall on Friday the 6th of March. Jessie was only 75, so must have gone to see them. The choir were a sensation. They returned to perform in Swansea in 1875, 1882 and 1889, the year Jessie died, age nearly 91. She lived her final years at Ayla Bryn in Sketty. The house no longer stands. I'm a Swansea-born musician and composer, and through the work Jessie Donaldson, her family and colleagues achieved from the 1850s, a choir of free slaves were welcomed to Swansea in 1874 to perform for us. A straight line can be drawn through history's timeline from Jessie's campaigning in America, running a safe house for fugitive slaves, 
with all its political dangers, to the Jubilee Singers' concerts in 1874. Their music told of their lost heritage and pleas for help through slave songs and gospel music. They performed for the Welsh poor and working classes who gave their pennies, forming strong bonds that called the choir back again in 1875, 1882 and 1889. Their last visit in 1907, this time by the Fisk Jubilee Trio, were fundraising events for the poor of Swansea, a thank you for the support the choir had received from Swansea over the years. So successful with the Fisk Jubilee Trio, a tour of the valleys was hastily arranged. Today, we can celebrate their music again as we have the African Community Centre in Swansea, founded by my mother, Uzo Iwobi, in 2003. So, Jesse Donaldson's timeline is currently running through my generation. And we can now pass the baton on to future generations by remembering Jesse Donaldson with this blue plaque. Thank you. In 1997, sitting in Swansea's reference library, reading the Cambria newspaper, I found, totally by accident, Jesse Donaldson's obituary, which was unusual, as newspapers just printed men's obituaries. And there it was, just a few lines saying a teacher and anti-slavery campaigner who left Swansea in 1854, when she was 57, emigrated to Cincinnati and ran a safe house for fleeing slaves. This sounded like quite a story. Over the years, I slowly pieced together her astonishing life as she had left no papers. I was able to visit the Cincinnati Local History Archives and found the American side of her story. With our resources at Jazz Heritage Wales, it was a revelation putting the Swansea and Cincinnati stories together and realising the legacy that Jesse Donaldson had left us. I'd like to thank the City and County of Swansea and the University of Wales, Trinity St David, for enabling my research work and for bringing this project to such a fitting conclusion with this plaque. Good afternoon. I'm Carl Westmoreland. I'm the senior historian here at the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, the building uh, behind me is a slave pen, a slave pen that was used uh, the way slave ships were used to bring black people out of Africa into the New World. Once they were taken into America, they were settled along the coast of Virginia, all the way down to Florida, and from Virginia north, all the way up to Massachusetts and what is now known as Maine. They were taken to the, to the United States to clear the land, to plant it, and to harvest it free. They weren't paid, and in fact, their families were broken up, uh, the women were abused sexually. Uh, the men, quite often, if they didn't obey or didn't perform uh, to suit the owners, they were beaten. When the cycle finished, in other words, eight, ten years later, and the land had begun to uh, be stripped of its vitamins, its its they were then shipped, walked in some cases, or taken by a boat 
to the interior and uh, to the west, in other words, going toward California. If you can imagine, quite often they were chained and walked or put on boats uh, to go to new places of enslavement and labor. This building uh, was in a hundred, within a hundred miles of where we're standing. And it was in a place called Maysville, Kentucky. This building is one of the last known to exist. And the documentation uh, you can see uh, on a piece of a This talks about buying and selling and offering a partnership to a brother of the Supreme Court Justice Thomas Marshall. Uh, while he was on the bench, his brother uh, was almost like a drug dealer in today's life in that uh, he was buying black people, he was providing financing uh, for the man who owned the building that we've been looking at, John W. Anderson. Uh, this today would be called a prospectus. In other words, an investment instrument where you talk about how much money uh, the person who bought uh, the enslaved people could make by selling them. John Anderson's role was to capture black people that he already owned uh, and package them, chain them, and then take them either by boat or walking a thousand miles to a place called Natchez, Mississippi. If you can imagine uh, seeing your little brother or a little sister for the last time and being chained to a man uh, next to you and walking that far. I got a phone call in 1998 in February from a gentleman who uh, identified himself as Raymond Edwards. And uh, he said that I have something that you need for your museum. Uh, you need something besides four walls or things that are just dead or stories about dead people. Uh, I don't know of a place where there are stories and tangible evidence of what was done to black people when they were brought to America. I have something that tells that story and I'd like to give it to you. I didn't believe him. And I told him I would call him back. Uh, it was raining, it was snowing, and I don't like anything after August. So my intention was to do nothing. I think he understood it by uh, the tone of my voice. And five minutes later, he called uh, my boss, who was a black gentleman from New Orleans, and uh, he was on leave from Procter & Gamble, where he serves, uh, and that's the world's largest soap manufacturer, and his intentions uh, was to uh, talk to my boss to make sure that I went to see the building. An hour later, after my boss uh, gave me the look, I was on the road and drove uh, almost 60 miles to Maysville, Kentucky. And this is what we found, or I found, inside uh, a big barn that had been built around it. Now, the chimney is missing uh, because here in America, uh, <laughs> anything old, we either throw away or we take it and use it for something else. So the chimney was taken down and was used to build a wall on a, another farm. What I did was um, I met with our architect and we decided to have a black blacksmith and my great grandfather was a, a blacksmith while he was enslaved and 
Um, if you could imagine one young man who was an apprentice to his father, did this iron work just like the way we did when we were enslaved. And um, inside, the floor was taken down uh, because they thought about tearing it down. Uh, but the men were chained and there was a chain that ran all the way through and then the men were chained to each other and sometimes they would be there a month, two months, three months and they would urinate on each other, they would defecate on each other and the women and the children were down here and they weren't chained, except they had to deal with the filth. They had to try to keep it clean. And then the journey would start to Mississippi. In America at that time, in the South, uh, there were very few roads. So if they were walking, they were walking on old Native American trails or uh, they were walking through the woods. Uh, they had to deal with snakes, alligators, and one out of four black people here in America has someone in their heritage, in their family line, that was owned by a white family and they were subjected to that kind of abuse. I'm Yvonne Jardine. I'm the council's champion for sanctuary and inclusion. Swansea Council has a blue plaque scheme celebrating the achievement of women. This plaque recognizes Jesse Donaldson's fight against slavery. I'm Councillor Robert Francis Davis. I'm the Cabinet Member for Investment, Regeneration and Tourism for the City and County of Swansea. Um, I have the responsibility for blue plaques within the City and County of Swansea. And today we are honouring uh, Jessie uh, Donaldson. Now, Jessie Donaldson was from Swansea. Um, when she was born, she was Jessie Heineken. Uh, and when she married uh, an American who she met in Swansea, eventually she went to America, where she um, did a tremendous amount of helping slaves from Kentucky as they came across the river to um, her home where she put a, a safe home to help slaves uh, escape from their, from their shackles, basically. So I'm proud that Swansea is playing its part at last to recognise Jesse Donaldson in this way by a blue plaque. We are a city of sanctuary and leading towards a, a city of human rights. And it's only fitting that Swansea recognise, at last, Jesse Donaldson. It is with great pride that the University of Wales Trinity St David have been able to work with not only our city's libraries and archives, but our own unique resource, Jazz Heritage Wales. It is the only multimedia jazz archive and library in Britain and based within our university. It is here we uncovered the Jesse Donaldson story. It received the Welsh Government St David Award for Culture in 2017. It is through using our libraries and archives resources that our young students can reach back into the past and rediscover important stories that were previously lost to history. After all, education is an exhilarating and lifelong experience, which our students can enhance throughout their lifetime of discovery. During these important times of Black Lives Matter, this has been an innovative, collaborative project, honouring the life 
of Jesse Donaldson, the anti-slavery campaigner within the city of Swansea. And as Vice Chancellor, I am so pleased that we have been part of discovering that story. And today we mark that particular narrative, not only in the life of Wales, but on an international stage. And that is why we honour the name and we secure here in the city a blue plaque to honour Jesse Donaldson. Thank you.